If you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and, and grab them and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Um, while you're turning there, I'm going to go ahead and make um, a book recommendation. I haven't done this in a while. Um, the name of this book is Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. Parenting Beyond Your Capacity, Connecting Your Family to a Wider Community. How many of you as, as parents, you know that you don't have everything? You don't have it all, do you? Uh, we don't have it all together. And the message I'm going to share uh, today, some of the ideas were inspired um, not only from the scripture, but as I read this book. And so if today's message really connects with you, this will be a, a really good resource for you to check out. Um, it expand on some, some of the points that, that I made today, give some others that, that I don't cover. And so uh, it's by Reggie Joyner. You can, it's probably in an ebook form, but that's the physical one. So Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. If you weren't here last week, let me give you a brief introduction. What is orange? Orange is when the church, which is yellow, because it is the light of the world. We sang about Jesus being the light, right? Let his light shine within us. Like the verse that we read from 1 John, the church is the light of the world because Jesus is, is amongst his church and he's in us and through us. And then red is the family because it's, it's the heart, it's the, the lifeblood of all of our journeys. All of us get here through the, the means of family and God has these two influences influences in the world, and he desires them to, to come together and to work together and become orange. So when the, the yellow of the church and the red of the family join together, they can make an orange impact. And last week was an introduction, so if you missed that, I encourage you to go online. You can watch it. You can listen to it. Today, we're going to actually focus on the red half a little bit more. We're going to talk about family. As I mentioned last week, how your family situation might look very different. We can talk about the ideal as it's put, put together in, in Scripture, what's God's ideal for a family. But then we have to deal with the reality that each of us, um, our families and what we call family can look very different. Um, lots of families are are, are broken. Does everybody know that every family is broken? right? Every family in some way has been affected by, by sin. There's no such thing as a, as a perfect family. Um, never has been and never will be. And, and, but that doesn't mean that God can't work in a huge way in your family and through your family. Uh, what I, if, if anything, I hope today it will be an encouragement. What I don't want to happen, we're going to be talking about orange family values. And so let me, let me go ahead and tell you how I don't want you to hear this message. I don't want you to hear it as... Uh, as just a weight of more and more duties. Do you ever just feel overwhelmed already in your family for some of the duties that you have as a husband and a, or a wife, as, as, a, as um, parents, or even as kids? Kids, you ever feel, uh, you know, students, teenagers, you ever feel overwhelmed because you got like a lot to do even within your family? Um, so I don't want this message to be that. Instead, I hope that it's an encouragement. I hope that there, maybe it'll be an encouragement that you're already living out some of these family values. And, and that it'll be an encouragement to be like, wow, God's already working in me and through me. Um, and then maybe it's just a challenge. Maybe it's just an encouragement. And so would, before we even begin, here's what I'd like for you to do. Would you just pray? Uh, we're going to pray together. And this is what I want us to ask ourselves. Say, God, would you just, just show me one thing, just one thing that you want to you wanna do in me? Um, as I listen to this message. Our, our goal is not just to hear a message, but to be changed by it. And so this, uh, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're single, married, divorced, you know, parent, child, whatever circumstance, I believe that God's going to say something to you today. So could we just bow our heads and we just ask the Lord to speak to you. Father, I pray right now as we prepare to, to look at your word, we believe that it, it changes us. We believe that your word is truth. And so as we approach it, we approach it as your word. And we ask that you change us from the inside out, move our hearts closer to you. We pray for our families, whatever our family looks like, that they would be more reflective, um, that the light of the church would just infiltrate and come into our into our lives, into our family, so that we can be orange. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want to start reading in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to read the first three verses. It says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you. 
and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So here we go. The, the person that's writing this is a guy named Moses. If you don't know anything about Moses, Moses had been called by God. Um, even though Moses had had not a great past reputation, he had killed someone, but God chooses to use him. And, and he rises Moses up and says, I'm going to work mightily through you in order to rescue these people called the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. And so that's exactly what Moses does. God works through Moses and the people are rescued out of slavery. And, and God comes to the people and he says, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. And he gives them um, regulations for how, how their relationship should function so that they can have uh, the right relationship between them. But then the people do something. They, they choose to rebel against the Lord. They choose to turn against the Lord. And so for the next 40 years, that generation of people, they all died out. So for 40 years, they're wandering around in the wilderness and, and now here we are, Moses, now that this 40 years has gone by, Moses is again, he's reminding them of all that the Lord ha had done and he is preparing them for what they're about to do. I think just the context of this is important for us because it's just a reminder that even if we look back at our past and how our family is and our past actions, doesn't mean that God is not still wanting to move mightily in us. And that's a, that's a good word. Do you ever just feel discouraged because you look at where you've been? You might look back and think, man, I've really messed this up. You know, I've really made a lot of mistakes. I haven't, my family's not exactly what I want it to be like. Well, the context is you, he, they're talking to people that understand that. People that have 40 years of mess ups, 40 years of failure, 40 years of wandering. And now here's Moses. He's saying, I I'm going to give you these words. The Lord has given me these words. This is like the last words he's going to give to the people. And I'm giving you this so that you can be successful, so that you can um, have experience the blessings that the Lord wants to give you. So that's the context of where we are. And now for our message today, we're going to focus on, on really the next five verses, Deuteronomy 4, I mean 6, 4 through 9. And this is what the words say. It says, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, some of you may be thinking, you're like, okay, um, I'm not an Israelite, and I'm not sure what he's talking about gates and right and stuff. I'm not. That's a little confusing to me. Uh, why? Why are we in in this day and age talking about something that happened thousands and thousands of years ago? Well, I want to. I want to give you um, a, a verse in Romans. 15, it explains why we take the time to look back at the stories of people that have gone before us. This is what Romans 15, 4 says. It says, for everything that was written in the past was written to, to do what? To teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have what? I don't know about you, but I want to have hope for my family. I want to have hope that God can work mightily in, in me and through me and through my kids and through, through my wife and, and brothers and sisters and, and everybody. I, I, want to, I want to have hope about that. And so when we're looking at these scriptures, we look at these words that were written so long ago, they're not just for the past. They're written for us today. And in these words, I see that there's, there's at least four values, four values that if we as, as families, if we and as individuals, if we would choose to embrace them, then I believe our families could be orange. I believe our families could be used mightily by God to impact not only our, our circle of families, but generations to come, to leave a legacy. Because isn't that really, it doesn't that seem to be the context that Moses isn't just writing to the people that are right here. He says, this is for you, your children and your children's children. And so the things that we learn today, the action steps that you take today can not only affect your moment right now, but could positively affect even generations to come, people that you 
will not ever meet, that you'll be off the scene. Isn't that kind of an amazing thought? That it's not just right here, right now that we need to be concerned about, but the actions that, that we're doing are going to affect the generations to come for, for positive or for negative. So what's the, what are the four values we're going to look at? Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, and I hope you will, I hope you're taking notes just to write down what the Lord say, says to you today. Number one, here's the first, widen the circle. Widen the circle. Now, um, in, in my family, I grew, I grew up as an only child, okay? So it was my mom, it was my, my dad, and it was me, okay? That's a pretty small circle, all right? But then... Um, something happened. Um, I, I also lived across the street from my grandmother, my grandfather, my great, my great aunt, you know, and, and they were a profound influence in my life. So my little small uh, family circle, it, it did what? It grew a little bit, didn't it? Because I had some other people influencing in my life that, that loved me. Now, you might be in a family situation where you're the only person that, that loves the Lord. And, and, and that influence can be, it could feel very small, can it? And we could feel a little bit discouraged and we might think, uh, oh my goodness, even as a, as a parent, how, how am I going to do this all by myself? Does anybody ever feel overwhelmed sometimes with, God, if I've got this great calling, I feel this as a father all the time. I've got this great calling to help lead my family to, to love Jesus. And sometimes I look at my own strengths and my own weaknesses and I say, God, I just don't, I don't have it all together to do that. Can anybody else relate to that? So what, why do I say widen the circle? It's, it's really contained in the first three words of Deuteronomy 6, 4. Moses says, hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. Now, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, hear, only fathers. He didn't say, hear, church leaders. Hear, and just name a few people. He said, O Israel, which means everybody. What we don't understand is this was the original Orange community. Because for them, family and church life was all tied up right here together. And so Moses is given these words, not just to a few people, he's given these words to everyone. That's the reason I say widen the circle. Parents, do you know that you have the greatest influence in your kid's life more than anybody? I don't know if you know that, but there's just something born into um, that relationship with parents that you are the greatest influence, but you are not the only influence your family needs. Husbands, you're not the only influence your wife needs. We're, we're, we need more than just outside our family. Does anybody ever have issues within your family? Anybody ever, ever, ever have that happen? And so sometimes when you have issues within your family, you're going to need some people outside of your family to be able to come in and help. Isn't that true? You're going to need some other influence. So the first thing I want you to see is this is just orange thinking that we need other people in our lives beyond just, just our small circle. So expand the circle, widen the circle of influence. Who is it in your life? Just think about this. Who else in your life is helping to bring a yellow God word, Jesus loving influence into your life, into your families? Who, who is that? Is it, do you have a friend? Are you a part of a life group? Do you have some people within uh, a life group here at church that they're able to, to pour into you, that when you have issues that they're able to walk with you? Or how about this? When you, I don't know if you know, right now, all the kids are back in the back. And so parents, when you brought your kids right now, you're inviting other influence into their life because there's leaders that are back there with them that love them, that care for them, that are teaching them God's words. That's widening the circle. Whenever parents, whenever you make a priority and you're telling your kids, hey, let's be a part of dive, let's go there. You know what you're doing? You're widening the circle. So th think right now, who, who are the people in your life? Do you have some other influences that are helping you to, to live a godly life? Because you can't do it by yourself. We can't do life alone and we'll never be everything that God called us to be. And our families will never be everything that God called us to be apart from having some other influences. So how, what are you going to do to widen the circle? What are you going to do? Because in case you don't know this, if, you don't, if you're not intentional about choosing the right influences, your circle of influence, it's going to widen by itself and it might not be the influences you want to come in. 
Because as a parent, I know something. I know that over time, my influence on my kids, that, that there's other influences that start to come in pretty strong. Isn't that true? For those of you that have seen your kids go from, you know, right in the home to go out, have you seen that your influence changes somewhat along the way? Doesn't mean you lose it. So what would happen if we were intentional about making sure that we had some godly influences in our life and in our family, other people that can bring some other perspectives to help us to think straight when we're, we don't necessarily think the things that we need to. Here's number two. I, I just, that's the orange principle. Being orange means we're doing life together, family and church united together. Number two, clarify the focus. If somebody were to ask you right now, what's the goal what, what's the purpose for your family? I think that a lot of us would just draw blanks. We'd be like, I hadn't really thought of a purpose for my family. You know, like, don't let them, like, you know, drink poisonous stuff, get hit by cars, you know, what, whatever it may be. Um, uh, if you don't have kids, you, you have a different one. I, I don't know. Maybe your goal, your family goal, your family focus is we want to make babies, okay? Maybe that's it. Um, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's a fun thing. Um, God gave us that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you're single. I have no idea. So what, if somebody were to ask you, what's the, what's the focus, what's the goal of your family? What would you say? If you're honest, you might just draw a big blank and say, I don't know. I'm just kind of going day to day. I'm just trying to, trying to do this thing day in and day out. Well, one of the concerns that Moses had for the people that God has for us is that we clarified the focus. Why has he put the family in this world? Why has he put you in the particular place that you are? So now listen, listen to his words. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, another way to translate this would be the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. The idea is they just came out of a culture. They just came out of an environment in which the Egyptians worshiped all these many gods. They had gods for the sun, gods for this, gods for this. And now here they are, they're, they're being reoriented to say, Hey, Israel, you only have one God. You only have one that you're supposed to worship, and it's the Lord our God, the one that rescued us. It's him alone. So what Moses is doing is he's resetting our focus. Now, I don't know about you, but I, this last week, I didn't really meet anybody that was worshiping the God Ra. You know, that just wasn't happening. Um, but do you think that we have some of the same challenges today? Uh, do we have challenges of, of just losing focus about what life is really all about or better to say who it's all about? It's easy to happen. Every, every person, every individual, every family can easily lose focus of what really matters. And so it starts out by he says, hey, the Lord, I, I want you to set the Lord before anything and everything. And now listen to what he goes on to say in verse five. He says to do what? Love the Lord your God, love the Lord your God. I'm just going to stop right there. Earlier, he, uh, Moses had told the people to fear the Lord your God. There's this idea of reverence and, and awe. And actually, when Moses talks about telling the people to, to love God, that was, that was radical. We talk a lot about love, but you know, they were used to hearing things like you know, fear God, obey God, respect God. But now, here they're told, to love God. And, and can I tell you, when, when, they're at, when you actually love God, you'll want to do those other things. And so Moses is, is reorienting. He's saying, God isn't just about this, this, this rote obedience. He, he's after your heart. He's after a true love. He's after a relationship with you. And so he says, love the Lord your God with what? with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Sometimes we're tempted to do this. Love the Lord your God with some of my heart, some of my soul, some of my strength. I'll give him, you know, love the Lord your God with your leftover heart, your leftover soul, your leftover strength. But Moses is saying, you've got to clarify the focus. Because God, I tell you, if you could get this right, there's other things that are going to flow. What are some of the goals that people have? You know, I, I think families often say, um, okay, our goal for our family is that, you know, we'll get a nice house, that, uh, you know, my kids will go to college, that they won't kill somebody, that, you know, they'll marry somebody that's, you know, pretty and nice, or they can get a good job and make money, that they're not a menace to society, you know, that they're not drinking their juice in the hood or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> 
those are some of the goals that they're, you know, those are some of the goals that people have for, for their family. And I'm not saying those are bad goals, but they can sometimes be substitute goals for loving God. But if you can get the focus right, that the goal is to love God, can I tell you that you might make some different decisions about the things that you hope for for your family, the things that you hope for for your relationship. Because if you get the God focus right, the other things will fall in line. But if you put other things in the focus, then everything's going to get out of whack. And so Moses begins by saying, you, you've got to have the right focus. It's about loving the Lord with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and his strength. What would happen if, if each and every individual and each and every family said, hey, the goal for my family is, is to lead the people in my family to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? How radically different could that be? What different decisions would you make? Would it affect how you use your time? Would it affect how you use your money? Would it affect how, how you do all sorts of things, how you speak to one another, the things you choose to do, the things you choose not to do? And so some of us just need to back up and we need to clarify the focus and say, what in the world is my family doing? You might say, I have no focus for my family. Well, he's trying to give you one right here. The focus for your family is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, Jesus thought that this was so important that when he was asked a question, he was asked this in Matthew 22, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, surprise, surprise, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Anybody ever heard of the 10 commandments? Y'all heard of those before? Well, the first half of that is all, uh, the Ten Commandments are broken up into two things. The first half is about loving the Lord. The second half is about loving your neighbor, which Jesus said are the two greatest commandments, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He follows this up. He says, and the second is like, it's love the neighbor as yourself. And the Ten Commandments live this out. But he says, hey, guess what? If you just want to sum it all up, if you would learn to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then... The decisions that you make, you would be flowing the right way. Your focus would be right. So some of us just need to, to clarify the focus. And Moses knew that we're going to have trouble sometimes with losing focus. Maybe as we're talking right now, you, you just look at your life, you look at your family, and you say, it's not where it needs to be, and I know it's not. Well, the Lord knew that was going to happen. Later on in, in verse 10, Deuteronomy 6, 10, this is what it says. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied... Be careful that you do not, what? Forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Do y'all know we have a tendency to forget the one who did everything for us? Notice what he says. He says, you're going to come into the land. You're going to get cities you didn't build and wells and vineyards and all that stuff. And did you do all that? He says, no, the Lord provided that for you. And do you know the same is true for us, that everything that we have in some ways come by the Lord's hand to us. He, he's given it to us. So uh, when we look around in this, in, in this world, we need to remember the one that gave us to us, but the tendency is to do what? That we can become so enamored with all the things that we forget the one who gave us those things. And we fall, fall in love with, with all those things. And he says, don't do that. You're going to be tempted to do it. And maybe for some of you, just the, the, the next step today is just to say, God, I've lost focus. I've lost track of what's really important. I, I've, I've forgotten that it's really about you. It's not about all the things that I have. And, and can I tell you, we don't live in a culture that's very friendly to helping us to keep God first. I mean, did you encounter a whole lot of things this week that just were like, man, let God be first, right? You know, I turn on the TV and, you know, every advertisement is in some way just enlightening my heart to love Jesus, right? That was sarcasm in case you missed it. I, I was, it was pretty thick. 
So I think these words that are right here, Psalm 86, 11, I just read this yesterday. It says, teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Do you ever feel like you have a divided heart? Do you ever feel like it gets kind of twisted? Well, most same, clarify the focus. Come back to what really matters. Get that in order first. And this kind of brings us to the next point because they're related. And this is, this is number three, is we have to take it to heart. Deuteronomy 6.6 6 says this, these commands that I give you today are to be on what? Your hearts. These commands that I give to you today, Deuteronomy, I want to read it just one more time. Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, these commands that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. We could sometimes think about what our family needs, but before we could think about what our family needs, we have to look at our own selves and say, what do I need? How many of you love something because um, someone in your family loved it? Like, I mean, think about anything. Does anybody love music because you had someone in your family that really loved music and they just influenced? Anybody? Anybody there? Um, How about, is there a particular sports team that some of you guys like because your family liked it? Anybody there? I mean, I think that's, that's pretty good. My, my girls, you know, they asked me, they said, Dad, which team do we pull for? <laughs> and, and I love that, you know, because, what, you know, there might come a day when all of a sudden they're like, well, what's their arch rival? I'm going to pull for them. You know, sometimes that happens. Like, uh, side note, this is just a uh, uh, side note. Um, me and Brian were playing putt-putt recently um, this weekend, and my daughter, Alora was there, and Brian and I went through 18 holes. We were tied, so we had to have some playoffs. And I discovered afterward, all of a sudden, she starts cheering for Brian. And I said... <laughs> I said, hey, this is messed up. Well, we were letting her choose the, the putt-putt holes that we really needed um, and, and for the playoffs. And all of a sudden, she looks around, and she says, hmm, that one. I said, why'd you pick that one? She said, because that's the one you did the worst on. And I said, that's messed up. I'm set up. And so Brian beat me because my daughter went against me, okay? Now... I know, I told you that was kind of a tangent, and that's okay. It was just, uh, it's a good story. But, you know, hopefully that your kids and and your family, they begin to love things that you love. And and you've probably seen this happen in your own own life. Can I tell you that your family uh, will never, uh, you can't lead them to love God if you don't love God. I mean, part, part of this that they were going to be required to do is they were going to retell the history of what God had done for them. And so they were going to be able to say, okay, hey, we were in slavery and, and God came and he, he did these signs and wonders and he rescued us out and he saved us. See, they had a, a story to tell about how they had personally encountered and experienced God. And so here's the question. Do you personally have a story about how you've encountered God, about how he has spiritually rescued you? See, we're not in physical slavery, but we have, we're all born in a, in a spiritual slavery and spiritual darkness, and we need the light of Jesus to come in. The question is, have you personally experienced that? Because you, you could hear all this. You could be a husband. You could be a wife, a kid, a, um, a parent, whoever you are. And you could want to influence other people. But you can never influence people to love something or someone that you do not love. It's just not going to be able to happen. It's not going to be in you. If anything, they're going to know it's a facade. I'm never going to tell my girls to love the Atlanta Falcons. I'm just not going to do it. They would know I was lying. I'm never going to tell them to love the University of South Carolina. It's just not going to happen. Now, those are things that really don't matter. To tell you the truth, that they came up and they said, Dad, I want to go to USC and I want to be a Gamecock. You know what I'd say? I'd say, well, if that's the best place for you to go, that's fine. I just said it right there, okay? That's cool. And then I'd have to have one of those bumper cigarettes that says house divided, okay? Okay. <laughs> But my point is that they know when I genuinely love something. And and people know that about you. And if you really want people to genuinely love God and and to be able to lead others around you to do that, it's got to be something that's happened in you. And so the question I ask today is, have you ever had a personal encounter with the God of this universe who willingly sent his son Jesus to come and live for you, to die for you, and to give you the opportunity to be brought from death to life? 
to have the opportunity to not spend eternity separated from him because of your sin, but to have your, the ability to spend not only this life, but the forever life with him in the paradise he created for us. Have you ever personally experienced that? Because you'll never be able to lead other people until you do. It's the reason you've got to take it to your own heart. And maybe, you, maybe today that you, you look at your own relationship and you'd say, yeah, I do, I do love Jesus. I do know that he's my savior. But the question is, are you progressing in that relationship? Because if we want others to be able to grow as disciples of Jesus, and y'all do know that's the point, right? It's not to, to get saved and then just to stay the way that we used to be. He's gonna change us from the inside out. And all the trying to change the external is just not going to work. There has to be an in, internal change that works its way out into our actions. That's the reason we sing a song that says, you know, from the inside out. We don't sing, God changed me from the outside in. Change me from the inside out. God, do a work in my own life. Maybe, maybe that's just the prayer that you need to make today. Say, God, I want, you to, I want you to begin working in my life in a mighty way. I want you to change my heart. Here's the third thing. Number four is work the rhythms. Do you know that every family has some kind of rhythm to it? Every family has some kind of pattern. Now your rhythm might be a little bit crazy. It may be like, I don't, what's the anti-rhythm? What, what, what is that? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's crazy, but the idea of having a, a rhythm is that you have some regular things that are repeating and they're coming back. And, and I have those for my family. There's certain things that I know that I'm going to do every day. I'm going to put my girls to bed at night. That's a rhythm. I know that's just, I'm at the stage of life right now where every night they want me to come in and tell them a story and give them a kiss and hug and, and do those nighttime things. I know I have that to look forward to every day. I know there's just certain patterns. Again, on Wednesday nights, I know it's daddy-daughter night. That's, that's our date night. That's what we go and do on Wednesdays. That's part, part of our rhythm. Now, I know I've got school-age kids. Some of you have totally different rhythms. Some of you are single, and your rhythms are like crazy. You can just do, like, do whatever you want. It's like, oh, it's Waffle House. I'm going to go there at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> and some of y'all are like, I was there last night. I mean, you could just do crazy stuff, right? You could just, your, so your rhythm might be a little bit uh, different. And husbands and wives, um, you've got a rhythm and you have to work that around a lot of things, don't you? Your jobs, and sometimes our jobs make it a little bit crazy. But here, here's the point. Church, uh, uh, what we're doing right now is just a small portion of your life. You've got a whole lot of other time and days in, in order to live out this principle of orange to helping your family and those around you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So what are the rhythms that you can use? What are the everyday experiences that you can use in order to have true spiritual conversations and to be able to display who God is to those around you? Listen to what, listen to these verses, verse seven. It says, impress them on your children. Impress what? Impress the commands, impress the stories, impress um, all the things that God has done in your life. First, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What, what Moses is saying is you need to work the rhythms. You need to understand the rhythms of your life and you need to use those as opportunities. Did you notice what he didn't say? He says, okay, sit down in your classroom setting with your family and give them all the instructions about what's important. Now, that might be the way that you do it. I mean, if you have young kids, they're going to like fall asleep. I just promise you that. But what are the opportunities that he mentioned? He says, when you're sitting and when you're doing what? You're walking. In Hebrew, putting these two things together is a way of saying at all moments. In the moments when you're just resting and in the moments when you're active. So what are, what are the moments, what are some of the rhythms in your life that right now that you could begin using in order to move your family toward loving the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Then he gives another example. He says, when you lie down and, and when you get up, what are those particular times during, during your day in which you personally can have some rhythms of, of loving the Lord? And what are some of the ones that you can lead your family to do that?
I mean, I, I shared with you, for me, it, it, every night, that's one of the best opportunities I have. And I try to have conversations uh, with my daughters, like, how was your day? You know, what was the best thing that happened today? Or, or how about this? You ever ride in the car with each other? Who, who spends a lot of time in the car? Anybody? And maybe a lot of time with other people. Those are great opportunities that maybe sometimes you just turn the radio off and you just say, ask the question. Hey, it could be anything. And you never know how the Lord might use that if you begin intentionally using those times in order to do what? To have spiritual conversations, to talk about things that, that, that really matter. We're sometimes good at having conversations about things that don't matter. But I don't know about you, but I want to be someone that's intentionally having conversations about things that do matter. I'm not saying you can't have goofy conversations um, and, and fun stuff. But we're at the rhythms by discussing, talking about when you're sitting, when you're waking, when you're lying down, when you're rising up. And one more. Also, we're at the rhythms by, by displaying, by actually living it out. See, have you ever heard someone say, don't just talk the talk, but also walk the walk, right? So this idea of working the rhythms is not just about the things you talk about, but it's also the things that, that you do, the things that you display. Now, he, Moses actually says, tie them as symbols on your hands and on your foreheads. Why hands and foreheads? Now, I mean, some people actually took this to like literally and they like, like put the verses like up on here, okay? Now, if you want to do that, you can. Um, I think it's probably missing a little bit of the point and you might look a little bit goofy, um, especially if it's up here on your forehead. Our hands, actions. Our head is our thoughts. The idea is the reason he says tie them on both of these places, let all of your actions and let all of your thoughts be of such that it's displaying who God is to other people. So what actions are you doing that reinforce the love of God? What, what thoughts are you having that are displaying? Um, because, you know, the things that we think end up coming out of us, don't they? And they end up leading to our actions. And then he gives one more. He says, write them on the door frames of your houses and on, on your gates. Now, yeah, that's cool. You know, anybody have that little thing that says, like, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And you actually put it up there. That's a very literal way of doing that. And that's cool if you want to hang Bible verses at your house. But I think it's more than that. The idea is the, uh, of in, on your door frames is what's happening inside of your house. And on the gates is what's happening outside of your house. So let everything, the thing, what about your home? What about the place where nobody's looking? What's your, do, do people see the love of God being displayed? What about outside of your home? Do people see that you are, are those that are leading your family to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Now you might be thinking, wow, you know, Pastor, you told me to think of like one thing to work on, and I thought of like 10. Um, what would happen if you just, you just thought of one thing and you said, Lord, just help me to today begin putting one thing into practice? I mean, you might have been overwhelmed. You might have wrote down 10 things you needed to start doing. Um, I, I decided I wanted to start working out, and, and my tendency is to want to do like 10 things at one time. I'm not going to drink soda. I'm going to run like 10 miles today. I'm going to do 50,000 push-ups, and I do that for like one day, okay? And then I'm like... I like soda and I hate running and I'm tired, okay? <laughs> so the tendency could be to have heard all these things and to be a little bit overwhelmed with it and to think, man, how am I going to start doing all that? Can I just tell you, what's the one thing? What's the, the number one thing that as we were talking today that the Lord just pressed it on your heart? Would you just be willing to take one step? Just one step today. And then you know what happens when you've consistently began taking that step? You know what you can do? Okay, I think I'll add in another step. I'll, I'll add in another step. I want to pray for us. If we would, could y'all just stand to your feet right here together? I want you to think about what, what's your one thing? What's the one thing you need just to lift up to the Lord today? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We think about how you have worked mightily in us and through us. And we pray that today as we've heard about what it means to be those that, that love you and how to pursue that, uh, God, we can become so overwhelmed with what we need to do. We can become discouraged. 
But God, I pray that this would be encouraged. I pray that just as you instruct us, you've given us these in stories so that we could be encouraged and we can have hope. God, I pray hope over each and every family here today. But God, I pray that we would uh, leave here, not just simply being hearers of the word, but doing, being doers of the word. So God, whatever the one step, the one thing that you're calling each person here to do, whether it's someone to, to give their, their life to Christ, to change their own heart, to, to begin some new rhythms within their family, whatever it may be, to clarify the focus, God, I pray that you enable us to take the steps that you've called us to. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here. Um, as, as you get ready to leave today, I just want to let you know about something. We have a counseling area in the back. Maybe you need to talk to somebody. Maybe your step today is, I need somebody to pray about, somebody to hold me accountable. I have some questions about my relationship with Jesus. Whatever it may be, there's a counseling area right to the back and to my right. If you want to go out there, we're so good, glad to see you. I hope you invite somebody to come join you next week as we continue in this series, Orange. Let me just uh, speak a blessing over you. I pray that the God of this universe who's called us to his glory will work mightily in you and through you all to his praise. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being here. We'll see you guys next week.